If you have your Bibles, Judges, Judges chapter 13, uh, verses 1 through 5, Judges chapter 13. The Word of God says, starting with verse 1, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. The Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much that you've again uh, trusted us in this space that we can hear and uh, read your word. We just ask for our hearts to be open to this message and allow your spirit to convict us and to transform. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this needs to be said from jump because scripture has a way of painting pictures of God that I think can obfuscate his, his, his character, his image. And so we need to clear this up. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and it says that God delivered them into the hands of the Philistines. Well, God did not hand deliver them into the Philistines' uh, arms. Uh, he did not inspire the Philistines to attack Israel. Even if the language communicates such in Scripture, you have to understand that even in the Hebrew, it's that God gives them up. That's what he does. Some translations actually say that, that he gives them up into the hands of their enemies. Now, what's interesting is that God doesn't give them up as a way of punishing them. God gives them up in a way of respecting them. If you look at even uh, uh, chapter 6 of Judges, you don't have to go there. It says the same thing. In fact, almost every uh, generation you have like this new uh, disobedience that just breaks out in the community and God has to step back and say, all right, all right, y'all do your thing. You clearly want to do your, your thing, so you do your way, go your direction, and I'll respect that. God giving us up is God respecting our freedom. Now, here's the issue. When God gives up his people, he also gives up his protection, right? Because being in the presence of God comes with some benefits, Following God's will and, 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 and following his instructions come with benefits. Remember Jesus, last week we talked about it, Jesus says, if you, if you keep my commandments, then you will remain in my love. He wasn't saying keep my commandments so that I can continue to love you. He says, no, 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 I'm loving you by giving you my commands. So if you remain in them, you follow them, you're going to be blessed by that love. You're going to be blessed and protected by it. So, so God puts up these guardrails to protect his people, but once they decide to operate outside of those boundaries, God is no longer responsible for what comes their way. This is really important, right, because this is all throughout the scripture. Even when the children of Israel were traveling through the wilderness and the serpents attacked them, the serpents were always in the wilderness. But when God was with them, in the midst of them, the serpents would not attack. Their sandals would not be worn out, right? But once they push God away, God is a gentleman, and he will respect your choices. So he will say, fine, do it your way. In Jeremiah, he says, if you want freedom from my laws, you can have freedom from my laws. But you also have the freedom to die by pestilence, and the freedom to die by war, and the freedom to die by famine. So he gives them up for 40 years, and, and after being in the uh, oppressive state of, uh, of, uh, of the Philistines, they're crying out for deliverance, and God hears their cry. In fact, the book of Judges is all about God hearing his people's cry and coming to the rescue, because this is an important distinction. You, have to, you, have, you can't miss this. Even though God will give us up, 
in respect to our choices, right? He gives us the freedom of choice. Even though God gives us up, he never gives up on us. Are you noticing the, dis the, the distinction there? He will give us up in respect to our choices, but he never gives up on us. In other words, he's always trailing, saying, I wonder when they're going to call. He's always checking his phone, seeing if there's any bubbles, because he can't wait to come back. But he only comes back with your permission. I stand at the door and I knock, and if anyone, we talked about this last week, if anyone hears and opens up the door, I will come in and I sup. God is always waiting for our invitation so that people want him to come back. And so they cry out for him to come back. And God makes his way. God's spirit will now reside with his people again. Now last week, we said some things. We said some things that might have unsettled some of you. We talked about, as we closed out the series on the Sabbath, we talked about what is the seal of God. And in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit has been referred to as the seal of God several times that God would seal his people with the Holy Spirit. And I referenced in Acts chapter 15 this experience that the disciples went through where there was a transition, a, a passing of the baton, if you will. It's in Acts chapter 15. I want you to go there because this is going to be really important to set the backdrop of what's happening here in this story. So in Acts chapter 15, I told you this last week that they had a board meeting because there were Gentiles that wanted to come into the faith, but it was a little daunting having to be circumcised as grown men. Y'all know that would be a, a terrible experience. That would be the worst way to get baptized. And so there was an argument that broke out among the people that this should not be required of the Gentiles. It wasn't fair to them. And so the disciples, they, they studied, they, 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 they discussed, and then it says in verse 6, Acts 15, verse 6, it says, the apostles and the elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. This is what Peter says. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from the lips the message of the gospel and believe. God who knows what? The heart showed that he accepted them by giving them what? The Holy Spirit, right? So that's how God showed that he accepted them, by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He says he did not discriminate between us and them. I want you to hold on to that phrase, us and them. He did not discriminate, for he purified their hearts by what? Faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. This is what they reasoned. Remember last week I talked about how new truth doesn't cancel out old truth. It's a further development of it. So circumcision at one point was a sign between God and his people. The Sabbath also was a sign between God and his people. But then as you mature into the New Testament, circumcision of flesh wasn't the sign. It was circumcision of what? The heart. The circumcision of flesh was to point people to the idea that their co covenant with God would be unbreakable. But of course, they broke it several times. God then transitioned his people to something far deeper, far more emotional, far more intimate, and says, no, 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 no. I want the heart now. The external stuff is good, but it's not as deep and profound as the heart. Circumcision of the heart is what Paul says. The principle of circumcision was not lost on them. It was what they focused on what was more important, right? The heart versus genitalia. Can we say that? The heart was far more important. And so this is what we, we, are, we are challenged to do, is to look at the spirit of these things. So when we go back to Judges chapter uh, 13, it's very interesting. This story appears to be about a man who is really strong and God is using 
to beat up the Philistines. I am here to tell you there is something far deeper and far more spiritual that I think all of us have to learn. Samson is one of the weakest people in all of Scripture. And we will uncover why I say that. But the people in the story that often go unnoticed are super strong. And I want to talk about the first one. I want to talk about Samson's mama. The one that gave birth to this Hulk. Chapter 13, verses 6 and 7, we're back in Judges. It says, then the woman went to her husband and, and, and told him, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name, but he said to me, you will become pregnant and you will have a son. Now then, drink no wine, no other fermented drinks, and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. Now understand this, her husband Manoah is hearing from his wife that a man was talking to her in the field saying, girl, you're going to be pregnant. And she hadn't been pregnant up to this point. So if I'm Manoah, I'm like, who talked to you? What's his name? What's his name? But she's like, I don't even know his name, boo. I don't even know his name. And he told you he was going to be pregnant? I'm just telling you, he looked like an angel of the Lord. Oh, he ain't no angel. <laughs> he should know better to be talking to my wife. If he has something to say to you, he should be saying it to me. Watch what his prayer is. Manoah prayed to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. But I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us to come again and to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. Now, did his wife already give him instruction? She already said exactly what the boy was supposed to do and not do. She had already told him, this is what the man of God gave to me. And he's like, all right, listen, God, do me a solid. Send that brother here again and let me talk to him man to man and he'll clear things up. I want to know what my boy's supposed to do. He wasn't taking his wife's word for it, was he? God heard Manoah's prayer and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field. Now, what was Manoah's prayer? Send the man to who? To me. And God said, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. I heard your prayer. And who did he send the man of God to again? Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? Why would he do that? Why would he? Why would he send the angel to, 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 uh, to Manoah's wife? I tell you, thank you so much, Bianca. That's so sweet. Thank you. Why would he do that? And here's the funny thing. We don't even know Manoah's wife's name. She's just his wife, right? The interesting thing here, the interesting thing here is that, is that there's a reason why the angel of the Lord is speaking to her and not to him. There's a reason why God keeps speaking to her and not to him. Do you know what the reason is so, so far? Do you know what the reason is? Let's continue. God heard the prayer. He then sends the, the angel of the Lord. But her husband Manoah was not with her. The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he says, are you the man that talked to my wife? He said, I am. Listen to what Manoah says as he continues on. So Manoah asked him in verse 12, when your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs this boy's life and work? Now, I want to pause there for a second. This is probably the most masculine charged conversation in all scripture. This is like such a man conversation, right? I, let me tell you why. Let me tell you. When men talk to each other, when they're introduced for the first time, the only almost always the first question is, what do you do? Right? What do you do? 
Oh, you know, I, I work in sales. Oh, oh, what? Tell me, right? What do you do? His first question is, I want to know what the man's work is going to be. You're blessed. What's he going to do? So masculine. Women, don't, don't frown because you ask the same questions of men. You do? Come on, be honest. Girl, I met somebody. Ooh, what does he do? That's the first question. Not, is he cute? Is he sweet? Does he go to church? The first question out of your mouth, what does he do? Oh, that's probably six figures. <laughs> Y'all should be ashamed of yourself. We should only care about character. Is he kind? Did he open the door for you? Oh, chivalrous. I love it. Right? What does he do? Now, men is a little bit different for us when we meet. We meet our boys, and they tell us, you know, hey, man, I met somebody. Our first question isn't, what does she do? <laughs> our first question is a little less spiritual. <laughs> what does she look like? <laughs> we mean that we want to know her character. That's what we're talking about. You guys see Gentiles. But this is what's happening. He's like, he says, he says, he says, what is, what is going to be his life's work? Tell me, I want to know. And watch what the angel says. Look at, look at the angel's response. Read it, read it. He says, he says, your wife must do all that I have told her. I, wait, okay, first of all, bro, let me just, let, first of all, I'm her husband, okay? And I pray that I could see you for myself. Because I got to talk to you man to man. And basically the angel says, uh, talk to your woman. We have silly conversations in our culture. We have created narratives that do not exist in Scripture. We have, I believe, many times have manipulated the word and wanted to see what, what, would, what would empower certain individuals in our society, what would continue certain stereotypes. But in Scripture, let me tell you something here. Women are respected. This is, this is the book of Judges. This is right after the Torah. And in the book of Judges, we even have one judge who is a woman. She's a, she's a wife. She's, I mean, she has all these hats she's wearing, and she led Israel for 40 years. This idea that women cannot lead and cannot be the messengers who God chooses is not biblical. Well, a woman can only speak when a man is not around. Her man is right there. And the angel chose to speak to her and not him. You gonna tell God that he, he's messing up with the patriarchy? But pastor, it's clear in scripture that man was made in the image of God and woman was made in the image of man. He came first, she's subservient. Uh, that's not exactly how Genesis paints it. Genesis gives us a story about how every day God is creating life to become more and more and more and more like him. If we follow the trajectory of the creation story, it is the final thing that's created that is even more like God. That is why Adam, man, both male and female, Adam was created last. Adam, both male and female, if you look at the chapter, chapter 1. But Eve, in that Adam narrative, was the last to be created. And Eve could do something that Adam, the male, could not. And come on, let's be honest. Let's be totally honest. Can we be totally honest right now? Totally honest? From other writings among our membership throughout our history, there was one who penned something very curious and said, the one thing that really upset Lucifer was that they could create and he could not. The image of God on earth was able to do something that not even the angels in heaven could do, even though the angels, according to Scripture, were made to be above mankind. What Eve is able to conceive within her womb, of course, with the help 
of the male is miraculous. It is God-like. So if you're following the trajectory of creation, by the time you get to Eve, it is even a more full expression of who God is. Does that make you feel uncomfortable? I know. I know. It's so difficult. But pastor, it says that Eve's desire would be for her man and he would rule over it. Yes, that came after sin. That was actually a prophecy of how, how life would be broken down to the point where there would be power struggles. And God is smart enough to know that men would rule because they would be stronger. They would be the ones that are out there hunting. They would be the ones that are out, out there fighting. The women would be caring for the children and men would overpower, they would be stronger. God wasn't simply giving the order of hierarchy. How do I know that? Because in the Trinity, in the Godhead, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? Is it the Father? Is it the Son? Is it the Holy Spirit? Because of how we're raised, all of us really think the Father is the top, the Son comes second, and the Holy Spirit comes third. Right? Let's be honest. We can't help but see with lens of power. Who is the strongest? Well, the Father, of course. He's the Father. Well, if you look at Philippians chapter 2, Jesus is elevated to the highest because he was willing to be the lowest. Who is the greatest? When the disciples were trying to jostle between one another, who was the greatest? Jesus says, this is a Gentile thing. This is not what goes down in the kingdom of God. The father doesn't think to himself, I'm greater than everybody else. The son doesn't say, I am so much better than the Holy Spirit. They don't have these conversations because power is not an issue in the kingdom of God. It's not even something that's celebrated. So if mankind, male and female, were made in the image of God, who's the greatest? Okay, pastor, roles, stop. Because right here, right here, this woman now has a role. She's been spoken to by God, and she's now to give instruction to her husband how we're going to raise our kid, and the angel will not say anything to Manoah. Talk to your wife. Now, what does that mean? Pastor, I can tell you right now the problem with our society is that we don't keep and hold to traditional values. That's why the home has been broken down. Women want to be men. Men are emasculated. That's the problem in this world. If that's how you see it, we're playing a game that they want us to play. I believe that God gifts everyone, and clearly this woman has a gift that God is bestowing on her. And that gifting lets us know what her role is. Not her genitalia, her spiritual gift. Can I say that again? It is her spiritual gift. It is her awareness. It is her ability to see and understand. Let me, let me see. How, watch how this breaks down. Don't, don't, don't get mad yet. Wait, wait. We'll, we'll reconcile this. Wait. So after he says, you must listen to your wife, listen to what happens. The angel of the Lord replied, even though, uh, this is right after he says this, the, uh, Manoah says, please, I want you to stay. Eat some food. Eat some food. And of course, the angel's a little bit annoyed by this time. And he says, even though you detain me, in verse 16, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord, Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. What did the woman say after she encountered the angel? What did she say? What did she say to her husband? I saw someone who I believe to be an angel of the Lord, a messenger from heaven. Manoah, after all of these conversations, after everything he's hearing, guess what? He still cannot see it. 
I'm going to say something to you right now. Y'all going to like it. Men, I'm talking to you. You ain't going to like it. If you refuse to be a spiritual leader in your home because you can't see God, you don't know him, do not be upset when your wife steps up because she sees what you cannot see. Well, she should, she should, she should know her place. No. Her allegiance first is not to you. It is to her heavenly father. It is to God who speaks to her directly. I've grown up in a, in a household of strong women. My grandmother was a strong, strong spiritual woman. And we all knew who was running the show. I love my grandfather. He'd walk around with his keys, always jingling on his, on his side hip. And he would be the disciplinarian. If we got out of line, he'd tell us to go outside in the backyard and get a switch. I know, y'all don't know what that is. Most of you kids know. It's not Nintendo. <laughs> but when it came to spiritual things, my grandfather was knowledgeable. He, he was an elder in the church. I saw him preach. In fact, the first time I said I wanted to be a pastor, I was listening to him preach in church. And I was five years old, and I said I want to be that one day. Of course, at six, I was like, oh, I was five. I didn't know what I was talking about. He was a spiritual leader. But in the home, we all knew Anna Henderson was who ran the show. She would get up at four o'clock in the morning just to pray. Four in the morning just to pray. And by five, she would then go out and run for miles and miles. She would run marathons, even in her 70s. Anna Henderson was spiritual. And we all knew when we wanted something to be done, nobody ever said, have Bob Henderson pray. That's my grandfather. Have Bob Henderson pray. No, no, no. You better get Sister Henderson to pray. If there was a prayer request that you really needed to go before God, you went to Anna Henderson. And at no point, at no point did my grandfather say, I can't believe you're exercising so many spiritual gifts around me. You're making me look small. When we are the part of the body of Christ, we celebrate all the parts that are doing as God has called them to do. Manoah, for whatever reason, could not see what his wife, who is nameless in the story, could see. The story of Samson starts with a woman who has spiritual insight. And when God sees that among his people, he latches onto it. It doesn't matter if you are young, you're old, if you're male, you're female, or confused. God will use you. His spirit will fall upon you. This is what Peter tells us. In Acts, Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, I'm sorry, it, it, it's in Acts chapter 2, but go to Joel, go to Joel chapter 2, sorry, go to Joel chapter 2. It's in Acts 2 because Peter quotes this in his sermon when everybody thinks the disciples are drunk and men and women are all speaking in tongues. Men and women are manifesting the spiritual gifts that God has given them. And he says, wait a second, guys, don't think we're drunk. We're absolutely not drunk. This is what the prophet Joel says, Joel 2. Joel 2, 28 and 29 says, and afterward I will pour out my spirit on how many people? It's at the very end, sorry, maybe. It's at the very close to the very end, the very end. I will pour out my spirit on how many people? All. All people. Your sons and your daughters. By the way, this is Old Testament. Your sons and your daughters will do what? Hmm, female prophets. Your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy, and your old men will what? Dream, dream. Seniors, your mission, your call, your task is not over. You can retire from your job, you can collect Social Security, but God is like, I'm still using you. I ain't done. My spirit will be poured out on you as well. And it says, your young men will see what? Visions. 
even on my servants. Watch this. Joel is really intentional about relaying what God says to him. My servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And it's interesting. We are part of a denomination that celebrates the spiritual gifts of one of its, you know, founding persons. One of the matriarchs in our church, Ellen White, who at a very young age manifested spiritual gifts, which we believed that should not be manifested because it only happened in Scripture. No, God is still pouring out his spirit. There are still people that can prophesy today. Do you believe that? Oh, you don't want to say that, huh? But that's what Scripture tells us. In these days, in these last days, Peter says, that God's Spirit will be poured out. And in our denomination, we have celebrated the spiritual gifts of one named Ellen White. No, I do not believe that she should be elevated over anyone else, but she clearly had a role in this church, in the history, and what she contributed to Christianity overall. And someone will say to me, but pastor, she wasn't, she wasn't a female senior pastor of a church. Let me tell you something right now. If Ellen White showed up at a church and there was a male senior pastor preaching and the church said, we have a choice between listening to her or our minister, you already know who's gonna win out, right? If she showed up today, she's not going to, she's sleeping in Christ. But if she showed up today, you would tell me to sit down. The point I'm simply making is this, is that God's spirit is being poured out on young, old, male, female, Jew, Gentile. A man who's named and a woman who's nameless. Let's close out. We're going to go back. Back to Judges. Verse 21. It says, when the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah, because he disappeared up in the flames, real kind of firework show, Manoah was blown away by it. It says, when the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. And what is his response, family? Finding out that God has been speaking to him through an angel, what's his response? We are doomed to die. We have seen God. My man just spoke to an angel. And his reaction is, we're all going to die. At this point, I think it be, should be very clear why Manoah was not the messenger. Why Manoah could not be trusted with this measure of the Spirit of God at this point in his life. We're all going to die. Could you imagine if his wife came back from speaking to the angel and said, Honey, I saw a strange man. He said some crazy stuff about me being pregnant one day. I think we're all going to die. Now, listen to this common sense here. Now, it's going to sound very logical, and I know that one of the arguments people have had about uh, women in leadership is that, you know, they're not, as, they're not as pragmatic, not as logical as men, and all these things. Uh, this is some logic coming up right now. You guys ready to hear it? Straight up logic. It's, it's Manoah who's all emo. She says to him, Verse 23, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things or told us this. Uh, yeah, yeah, duh. Very logical, very analytical. God's spirit is to be poured out on all flesh. And in this story, it starts with Samson's mother. She has spiritual insight that Manoah does not have. She could see God, and he couldn't. And I'm going to say something. 
if you have leaders in your church that do not see God, they cannot be trusted. If they don't see who God is, they cannot be trusted. I have real big issues. I don't care how dynamic they are as a preacher. If they cannot see God, meaning that the character of God cannot be clearly represented, that we see in Scripture, I have issues. I have a problem with any person who wants to talk about the love of Christ and his grace and how it's sufficient. But if you don't accept it, you will burn forever because God is just. That is satanic. That sounds like Manoah, we're doomed. Spiritual sight that allows us to see who God is. Because if you can't see who God is, you will not be able to interpret the spirits, as Paul says. You will not be able to judge between the spirits what is good and what is bad. You'll see something that you'll claim is from God when it's really from the enemy. And this is why so many people in Christianity can be bipolar. Because they'll say one thing, preach one thing, and live out something completely different. Or they'll say one thing one day, and in another week they'll say something that's, that's op opposite of that. We have to be consistent with the Holy Spirit as is, his first responsibility is to convict us and to show us the truth between good and evil, according to Jesus in John 16. So let's close out in this. Judges, we're still in Judges uh, chapter 13, verses 24 and 25. It says, the woman gave birth to a boy, and she named him Samson. He grew, and the Lord did what? Blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to do what? Stir him while he was in Mahane, Dan, between Zorah and Eshtal. The Spirit began to do what? Stir Samson. The question we have is when the Spirit steers, st stirs Samson, is he going to be more like his mama or more like his daddy? The question is for you today, too. As the Spirit stirs you, who are you going to be more like? Manoah? or the nameless wife. Can I lift up this nameless person today and say she's a good example of somebody who could see God and trust his face, to trust his character. The song says this, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love for it is a firm foundation. Praise team, come forward as we close out. Church family, we're going to start this new journey. And it begins with our eyes being opened. It begins with being open to the Holy Spirit and for God to stir us and show us things that we maybe have never seen before. It begins with you not being an otherist, otherism. Oh, he can't speak to you. Oh, he couldn't possibly talk to you because that's not your role. You're too young, you're too old, you don't get it. You're female, you're, you're, you're just an obstinate male. God's spirit is gonna be poured out on all flesh. He couldn't pour it out on you, you're Catholic, you're Buddhist. And God is like, I'm gonna pour out my spirit on all flesh, on all flesh. He wants to stir you. The question is, what's your response going to be? Manoah or the nameless one? As we start this new journey of getting to know the Holy Spirit and the gift that God wants to pour out on us so that we can be used 
in ways that deliver people, that transform communities, that transform homes, schools, churches. And you want to be a part of that. And you want to start off by being like the nameless wife in this story. Your eyes simply being able to see spiritual things. Spiritual strength starts with spiritual sight. That's where it starts first. I can see you, God. I can hear you. And I am not afraid. If that's your desire, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we close. We're just going to close out in prayer and benediction. It's a firm foundation, church family. It's a firm foundation. Father, you see us standing here right now. We want to receive the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Father, we feel like we've been Manoah, having the wrong conversations, seeing you unclearly. And because we can't see you correctly, we, we don't hear you the right way. So Father, whatever is needed in order for us to see you more clearly, we're asking you to bring that to the surface right now. We bring it to you. We want your spirit to stir us so that we can get rid of those ingredients that no longer need to be a part of our life and makeup. Father, we want to humble ourselves, be more contrite, be, be more, Father, like your son Jesus Christ who humbled himself. May we get rid of the power struggle and the power dynamics. That's a byproduct of sin. It is not your kingdom. And so, Father, if it's a young person that is, it is overcome and moved by your Holy Spirit, may that child be able to come forward in confidence and help lead us and help share a message. It won't be just the people that have a degree, the people that went to seminary, the people that have their Ph.D., we know your Holy Spirit can fall on all flesh if it's a seven-year-old, if it's a rock, if it's a donkey, whoever you want to use. Father, we're just going to trust you. Pour out your Spirit on us as we begin this journey. And may the end product be that we are more like you, that we are holy and set apart so that we can love people better and we can teach a world about who you are. They all need to see you. We want to see you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, church family. God bless you. God bless you.